What is paganism? What is Wicca? Their belief systems, traditions, and rituals. Seen here, the creation of the Balefire as part of the Beltane Festival, marking the longest day of the year. Who are some of paganism and Wicca's contemporary adherents, and what draws them to these spiritual paths? Welcome to Exploring Paganism. In this episode, we look at life cycle events from birth to death and the ritual objects used to mark these and other observances. Lydia M. N. Crabtree is an author, advocate, and a high priestess with the Willow Dragonstone Community and Coven, based in suburban Atlanta. One of the things you have to understand about Willow is that we're progressive. So we have open Sabbaths, um, we kind of have a come-as-you-are attitude, and we don't have any dogma of practice or belief. And what that means is, when you come here, we're going to show you many different ways to celebrate the Sabbaths and many different ways to celebrate the moons, and there's not one way of doing it. Most other groups don't work that way, and there's, you know, where we are run more on consensus. Um, most other groups are run by a hierarchy of a high priest or high priestess being in charge. And, and they um, have used group dynamics in such a way that keeping secrets and keeping the craft kind of quiet and on the down low is advantageous to their group mind. And so that's one of the ways you can go. And I like to call them the high witches. They, they do everything a certain way, and all the tools have to be within a certain boundary, and there are all these rules that you would hear to. And progressive witches tend to say, that is very, that seems very familiar to us. And it's familiar because that is the way Christianity, especially the Catholic Church runs. And so progressive witches have come to a place where we question that. And we say, mm, is that really what the craft is? Or is that just the way we're comfortable with the craft because we were all raised Christian and in a Christian society? So it makes it very, a very different view. And I think there's a value to both sides. Not every one person is going to fit into one, of, one group. And so you need to have these different groups. And they need to have a focus. And, they're doing, you know, for me, I feel like they're doing research in a very specific area that I would never go because that's not, you know, that's not my cup of tea. But it's not, doesn't mean it's not important and it doesn't mean it's not valid. Here's the chalice that we've been using. Um, Any particular uh, meaning to those symbols on it? Well, this is actually, this particular one is the maiden mother crone. So if you look at the faces, you have the maiden you have the mother, you have the crone. And the triple goddess aspect is a big deal in paganism and often referred to. So when we do, uh, when we use our chalice, we also use the plate. Both of these, uh, you can think of these, um, and I'll use the plate. You can think of these as a portal for abundance. So we put our cakes on here. We're actually visualizing the earth coming up through the cake charging the cake with the power of the earth and the fertility of it. And then we're going to take some of that into ourselves to help ground us after we've done this great big ritual and had all this energy. And I put, I made this and I'm not an artist, but I put a little pentacle on it because that was important to me. Um, and there's a blessing that's set over it by the priest and priestess who are in charge of the writ, of the ritual. And so that's what this plate is for now. Not all traditions will use a plate. This is uh, definitely not universal, but it is something that we do here at Willow. The chalice, however, is always part of ritual because we have the idea that the chalice and the blade conjoined represent the unity of creation. And so you might see something like that. You might see images like that where the chalice and the blade are joined. Um, so, and again, we're thinking of that series of creation. Here's the energy of the earth coming in and filling up this chalice that we can in drink. And here's the power of our will. And we're joining them together in this place. And then when we drink of, of the cup, we've, we've, we're drinking of that energy of combination and spirituality that we've created. The stack is a representation. You know, we do, we do view divinity 
in ways that are well outside the box of a white Jesus with a beard. Um, and the stag that's actually on there is a representation of the god Crudinos, which is the stag god from European cultures. And it happens to be what my husband worships, and so that's why it's on the, on the altar. And then to the left of that, there is a bust of a warrior woman, and her name is the Morgan, and that's the goddess that I worship, so hence why she's on there. There are also some really great um, Venus uh, de Milo statues, the big woman, big hips, big, big breasts, big body. And that actually represents the fertility of womanhood and its connection to the fertility of the earth. So I think there are two or three like that on there as well. So this is a cingulum. All cingulums have a loop that represents feminine, and then it'll have a knot loop that represents the masculine. And then when you tie them together, you're reminded of the fertility and union that is, creates magic when you slip them through. This is a good way, you know, a lot of us don't wear ritual robes. We don't have Sunday clothes, but we may have this and we'll wrap it on. And as we do, we're, we're, we're understanding we're leaving one place and entering into worship. And then mine is um, the colors that would indicate for Willow that I'm clergy. Because in paganism, we uh, are a, a system, just like the Masons are a system of degrees, paganism is also developed into a system of degrees, usually three. And so my cingulum um, has the cords that would denote me as a high priestess. And, and in fact, denote me as a high priestess only to willow people, because nobody else would know the color scheme. Well, we put the flowers on because we are an earth-based religion and we're inside. Typically, if we're outside, we probably wouldn't do that. Um, but it's a nice reminder when you're indoors that we are tied to nature, even if you're in a, an enclosed space. Most people are used to in incense holders that are flat. Ours is not. <laughs> we have a, a wine bottle that an artisan has taken. And what they do is they give you this little jump ring. So now you light your incense and you stick it into the bottle. And then you have an incense holder, and it has a nice little hole so it doesn't go out, and then it'll blow your incense, and it also catches all the ashes, so no mess. So, and this is one that um, I picked up because it had a dragon on it. <laughs> That's how about that came to be. And the chime is actually, uh, those are both symbols and tools of air. And they're used in cleansing. I mean, if you light incense, you're cleansing the air. Um, if you use a bell, think of uh, the musical qualities of tone and its effect. I mean, I go get any bell, ring it, and put it right up to your head. You'll feel that energy vibration. And so that is actually often how we'll cleanse people before we actually have ritual. If you start moving that over your body, it interacts with your energy field that we know exists, and it can help calm and focus yourself, and that's why it's used. This, we started using this the most, especially when we have people here who have COPD or have asthma, um, so it's a preferable to use this than the incense because it doesn't have a, a negative effect on the people who are participating. So that is another common tool. So like any other religion, we love our music, and most of our music comes from drumming, which I feel like is a primal way to connect to your own heartbeat that is the heartbeat of the earth and so you kind of have that juxtaposition so it's also a great way to raise energy if you've ever been to a drum circle you know what I mean they start out really slow and then they get more and more and more and there's a place where everybody's really ecstatic and it's really fast and you can barely keep up and then it, it's all gone it's an energetic raising tool I'm Celtic right so and I've said that before but so this is a baron or a bolron I don't know. I actually had someone from Ireland recently try to get me to say it right, and I, I butcher it every time. But one of the most common uses for the drums in paganism is to find a heartbeat. It's a little fast. But we might raise energy by starting that off really slow. And then speeding that up. And as you do that, the energy changes in the area that you're in, and um, it, it can be used to, you use that energy to charge 
your spell or your wishes or your prayers and send them into the universe. We're doing this at Osara. Um, we'll be using music and dance to do that. That's a very common thing. Um, so that's why you see a lot of drums. You'll go to any, any drum circle, you're gonna find pagans. They may not tell you they're pagan, but they're there. <laughs> That's the coven, that's the coven magical cabinet. It has herbs and tools and candlesticks and gosh, oils and anything that someone might need to create a spell because people can come to our coven set at any time and use these items to create a spell for themselves. That's part of the beauty of being in a community. You don't have to have every single tool. Some of the things I have in there are very expensive to buy individually. But as a group, we can afford to have them and everybody gets to use them. Coven is a group of people bound by common purpose who move forward together to love and learn and have protection. That to me is a coven. Um, there are all kinds of ways covens can be created these days. And most, you know, the most traditional people hear of is a high priest and a high priestess, and they're in charge and what they say goes. And, and kind of the authority trickles down from them. Willow is different because we're a progressive coven, and what that means is that our officers are elected. I'm president, but I serve only at the leisure of my community. This is a, the, the words on that particular one says, blessed be thy womb without which we would not be. And it is again a reference to the feminine, the power of the feminine creation. And this, this particular, the way these figures are standing is very common um, in paganism. The priest will, the priest or the masculine representative will kneel before the, the priestess or the feminine representation. And he'll bless her to be, to, to bring into circle the energy of the goddess and the energy of the feminine. In most groups, this type of adoration is reserved only for women. Um, in our group, it is not. The priestess also kneels for the priest because we fit, find that both are needed in equity. So we have a very clear view and understanding that one is not greater than the other. But there are plenty of pagans who don't necessarily ascribe to that. Not to okay. lose the other. One of the great things about the pagan gods is your relationship with them is yours, and it's an insight to one aspect, to that god or goddess, and everyone else can have a different view, doesn't change how you're affected and how you deal with that god or goddess. My goddess chose me, nobody was around, I wasn't looking for a goddess, that was not the deal, and once she chose me I knew and I was done and that was it. I've been in ritual where I was calling a goddess in and um, another goddess shows up, and I knew in that moment it belonged to someone else in circle. And every, like, one of the other members was like, oh, this goddess just showed up. And I'm like, yeah, what's up with that? And so I've seen it happen both ways. I've seen it be a community thing, like they've been in community and then we help bring that in. And then I've seen the goddess choose someone. I've also seen, I've been privileged to witness um, one of our members who is American Indian and has been raised on the reservation. And she has begun to worship the gods of the natives in a very deep and personal way and she's pursued um, their ancient knowledge and their their knowledge back when they were seen as gods not just spirits of the land and I've seen that really transform her so I've seen it happen all kinds of ways I think it's very individual and one of our friends of community Drake made this for us this symbol is actually um, a willow but it shows how we are all connected. That's why the knot work goes all the way around. And um, it also demonstrates the um, pagan axiom, as above, so below. And what that means is, as it is in the heavens, so it is on earth. But it also means, as it is with one willow member, so it is with all of us. And it also means, as strong as our roots are, so are we fertile. So there's all kinds of information here about about spirituality and pagan spirituality. This is also kind of a nod to Yggdrasil, which is the Norse world tree. It's also a nod to um, the Kabbalistic trees that you might see. So there's all kinds of information with that. And then there's a little symbol that, it's a sigil that we've created that just says this, this is us specifically. And uh, yeah, Drake did a great job with that. And then the back 
he was kind enough to create a portable pentacle for us to use with the four elements represented um, for when we wanted to do spell week working as a group. It may not be widely known, but a common expression like tying the knot for getting married comes from a pagan life cycle tradition, and it's not the only one. Well, again, I'm going to go back to the Wheel of the Year because you can, the Wheel of the Year for me is an amazing thing because it reflects the agriculture, but it also reflects life. So at Yule, the, the God is born, the sun returns, the S-U-N returns, and then we can follow his progress through childhood and into kingship, into marriage at Beltane, into the father aspect where he's leading people into the harvest and into his death at Samhain. And we can do the same for the goddess. So she has a diff slightly different timing on the wheel, but it's the same idea. So for us, our religion is about that endless cycle of life, death, and rebirth over and over and over again. And we celebrate it every year throughout the eight Sabbaths. You have wickenings, and um, in Willow, you end up with a, give, being given a, a box that's typically um, made of wood. And then all of the different members of the community will create kind of ribbons, like you know how you see the first place ribbons, something like that. And on the, the little trail, trailing ribbon, um, these community members have written well wishes, health, joy, love, and then they give them to the parents for the child and it's all put into a box. And the idea is that when the child comes of age, they'll be able to know that they started their life with all the well wishes in the world and that there was a large people who got together on one specific day to celebrate who they are. Physical maturation, we call those coming of age for male and female. Um, and that's, it depends on the parents when that kind of happens. But there's typically, you know, the women will gather if she's in Mincy, and then the men will gather if the young man has been determined to come of age. And then in both, there's usually some trials. We try to help them own the idea that they've left behind a part of their life and are embracing another. Um, and there are all kinds of ways that that's done. And uh, so that's the life cycle there. Um, I personally think there should also be, in modern times, the, what I call your 18, <laughs> which is for me a whole nother ceremony where you sit down and you do practical things like change the time of curfew and set up whether or not they're gonna pay rent, um, things like that, where you really give them that final push into adulthood. And then most people from that move on to hand fasting. Sarah Neal is also a leader at Willow Dragonstone Community and Coven. My eldest just went through her coming of age ritual last summer. Um, and we went to a former teacher and current mentor of mine um, to her house out in Brevard, North Carolina. And it sits just by itself overlooking acres and she's got sweat lodge and outdoor circle and just this beautiful, wonderful place that I was at frequently when I was pregnant with my daughter. So it felt very, um, oh, it felt very uh, cyclical uh, to come back to that place with her. Um, and her, um, Kathleen's granddaughter was also uh, going through the ritual as well. So they had each other together to tame any fears. Um, and we let them, we put them in separate spots kind of in the, on the property where we could hear them, but separate, so they could kind of sit in silence for a while um, before and just kind of reflect on what they felt it meant to become a woman. And then we put them in their white dresses and we carried them out to circle. We're kind of, you know, trying to freak them out just a little bit, just to get the exact, you know, just kind of work that up a little bit because it's fun and we can't. So. <laughs> Um, but once we got into circle, all of us, and Dia was there as well, because she's one of Tara's goddess mothers. We got there in circle and we all talked about, um, we gave them verbal gifts or advice of being a woman and what it meant to be a woman. 
Um, and then something that was very powerful for all of us, I think, we had this red string that we tied around all of our wrists and we brought the girls into the circle and tied their wrists with the string too so that we we're all apart and brought them into the circle of womanhood where we had the maidens and then the mothers and then the crone spiders. So um, it was very touching and very moving to um, watch them come up with that um, and let them know that because we're brought up to think, oh, you have your period, it's a curse, it's a curse, it's a curse. But look at the beauty that comes with that. Um, and I gave her a chalice um, that I painted uh, lots of bright colors on the outside and then on the inside I painted very dark because we can't always see deep inside. We have to look very closely to see what's deep inside of us. Um, and then, you know, Dia said, and remember what you're putting into your chalice. You don't want to put anything nasty into your chalice and, and taking the idea of our bodies as chalice as well. So there was also a little sex education going on there as well. So, which is important because I think as a society, we tend to avoid the talk, which is not beneficial to our children. So, um, but to, I, she and I, I wore that red thing on my wrist until it fell off. Um, and my daughter did too, and she just, it helped increase our bond, I think, and know that no matter what, we're there and we're connected. Um, I always told them of an energetic connection between me and them, and then she had this physical manifestation of that and of her invitation into the circle of great feminine divine. And the pagan culture hand fasting can be what we call legal, or it can be time indicated, meaning a couple gets together and uh, in my case, I met my husband and he was like, so move in with me. But I had a child and I said, um, yeah, no, I have to have some kind of agreement. So we actually wrote a little contract. It wasn't legal to anyone else but us, but it wrote out like if, if he left me, what, because he was moving me out of my house and just kind of the, the understanding of what would happen if it did dissolve. And that it ended with, if this works out, then we'll get legally married in a year. And that's what we did. We lived together for a year. We had, there was a 20, I'll never forget it, there was a 29 time period between the day of my hand fasting, the year before, and my legal marriage. So we joked that we were nothing <laughs> during that 29. That was a big joke between us. And then we got legally married. Croning and saging is what we call that. When a woman goes into menopause, we will crone her. Um, and when a man decides that he's matured and to the place where he's no longer, I like to say, when they, when they really don't want to go in the fields anymore <laughs> and they're kind of slowing down, then they've earned the right of saging. And again, it's a, usually a gender specific thing, maleness and femaleness, and they get together and celebrate the, the sage. Maybe we'll teach her how to crochet if she doesn't know how, uh, the crone. Maybe the sage, uh, the sage will be taught how to whittle, <laughs> things like that. But, but just a way to mark and honor that they've moved on to another type timing in life. So there are different death rituals and it really depends I've found on who has passed on um, and how that would want to be remembered. Shortly before the Beltane Festival in 2017, the Willow Dragonstone community experienced the death of a beloved founding member. For us, uh, Renee is a very special, special uh, circumstance because Renee was older. She was in her late 70s, um, and she was, a fa she was at our founding meeting. She was at the ritual to establish this group, so she has been with us from the very beginning. And because of her age and her time in the craft, she started into the craft in 1971, which was the year I was born. So she's been craft a long, long time. Um, but because of all of those things, she gets to be thought of by our group as what we call the mighty dead. The mighty dead are ancestors that are related just to our group that go over and we know that they're going to be intercessors for us. So it's like getting an instant saint. We used to tease her. We, you know, she was terminal and we knew she was sick. So I would, she would go, I don't want to die. And I'm like, dude, I want you to die. I need a mighty dead on my side. <laughs> And she would laugh and go, well, you know, that'll be all right. Um, 
And I laugh at that, but when she died, there were no kidding about five of us in the community who needed a job or something. And within a week of her death, they, all those needs have been met, all of them, far none. So Renee has become our first mighty dead. So it's a very, not only did we have a death, but it was that a significant a cornerstone death for us. And it was, we knew she was dying, but we all thought we got three more months, four more months, six more months, maybe another year. No one thought that it would happen as quickly as it did or when it did. It was just really out of the blue. And the way that we celebrate um, it is to celebrate the life. So we had a celebration of life. And um, we, of course, are taking care of her spouse and partner and making sure that she has everything she needs going through this transition. We've been through all the legal stuff with her. We've gotten her to lawyers. We've made sure that everything is good. Um, that's how we honor Renee. But the cool thing about us is that we can get to Ren Renee's gone, but never forgotten. She, you saw that she has a special cup. Um, she was a rune master, so it has runes all over it. And I, before ritual started, poured her, she was German. So this is nothing disrespectful to the dead. She likes strong German beer and Jägermeister <laughs> and vodka. So today the cup had vodka, so that's what I had. But, you know, that's what we do. And so she's not gone and she, we, she's still talking to us. And, but it is the, the loss of her presence is something that I think any spiritual path feels. Um, we just are comforted to have a belief that she's not that far. She's not that far away. She still can talk to us. She's still helping us. And that's why we call her the Mighty Dead. One of the things we do like to do is kind of play off some of these misnomers, right? And so to me, the funny thing to know is that it was just water and dry ice. That's what was in the cauldron. And, you know, um, but there's a little bit of that. If anytime you can kind of play off that mysticism, I think is it makes it fun and it makes it magical. And, you know, we do believe that magic works. We have, I mean, there are plenty of us in Willow who believe Renee died and the reason they have a job is because she went right over to the other side and started working that out. So that is definitely a strong part of us. And we don't talk about that a lot. And I think that's to our detriment because that shows a level of faith a belief in something you can't see or, or actually prove um, that is the same from faith to faith to faith, right? Everybody has that, and, and we do too. We just look at it a little differently, you know. Thank you.